Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of this new day, which we have never seen before. This opportunity to worship you once again in spirit and in truth, and to walk alongside one another and share our lives with each other. We thank you, Lord, for this assembly of saints, this community of faith, and the fact that we are not alone on our life journey of discipleship. We give you thanks for the ministries of this particular congregation and for your greater kingdom. Lord, at this time we seek healing. We seek wisdom and understanding. We seek depth and substance and significance. We seek meaning and purpose. We seek transformation. We seek joy. Bless us now, Lord, as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> My sermon text for today is the gospel lesson, which has just been read. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42 is the famous but brief story of Jesus stopping off at Mary and Martha's house. Uh, Luke 10, verses 38 through 42, and my sermon title for today is The True Declaration House. The True Declaration House. Many years ago, while living in Philadelphia, I read David McCulloch's biography of John Adams, our nation's second president, in which I discovered a historical tidbit I had not known previously. Namely, that Thomas Jefferson had penned the Declaration of Independence while renting a room on the second floor of a house on the southwest corner of 7th and Market Streets in downtown Philly, what is known to the locals as Center City. I thought to myself, how many times have I passed that intersection while walking downtown and not known its historical significance? So I went down to find out where it was, or at least where it had been, and discovered that the house was actually still largely preserved, though definitely obscured by its surrounding, taller, more gleaming buildings and skyscrapers. It was quite a modest house. The house, I discovered, is quite fittingly called the Declaration House. Since my parents were history buffs as well, I took them down to see it, on a subsequent July 4th visit to town. The building was not open, so we admired it from outside. We looked up to the second floor windows and marveled at the fact that in that room, in that very space, Thomas Jefferson had conceived and recorded the words that would shape and determine American history, and some would say world history. We hold these truths to be self-evident and in 18th century language that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. My father pointed out the goosebumps on his arms at the discovery of the actual physical sight of these grand words and this noble idea even as he lamented the fact that all the passerby seemed as oblivious to the profound significance of this sight as I had previously been, simply walking briskly by, unawares of what took place within a few feet from their hurried paths. It occurred to me later on how similarly one could view our modern day Christian church as an overlooked relic of the past, where powerful and life-changing events once took place, but which has now been overshadowed by taller, more gleaming options which crowd out and obfuscate the significance of our sacred space and our hallowed ground. I wondered how many people gathered outside at the curb and got goosebumps when they gazed up at our stained glass windows and our cross-topped steeples and thought, there, just behind those walls, is where a similar statement 
was first given birth. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. How many have stopped and stared, gaped and gawked at our physical spaces in awe and with dampened eyes, thinking this is the physical sight which bequeathed to the world the idea and the words for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whosoever might believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I can't help but wonder sometimes if the Christian church has become like the so-called Declaration House. A museum piece inspiring tears and Goosebumps on the part of a privileged few who were in the know, while the masses simply rushed by at a frenzied pace, oblivious to the history-altering event still taking place behind our walls. Do you feel like I do sometimes, my friends, like a curator or guardian or caretaker of a precious and valuable jewel which the world at large no longer seems to desire to see or experience for any number of reasons. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1 says of us, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards. Of the mysteries of God. But what if the world no longer hungers for. Or desires to partake of. Or is simply too busy and preoccupied for. The mysteries of God. Our different texts today have a thematic unity. And are wisely chosen. There is a resonant verse you may have heard of in Hebrews 13 which instructs us not to neglect showing hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some have thereby entertained angels unawares. That verse refers to the account we have before us in Genesis chapter 18, which is assigned as our old lesson testament for today, wherein Abraham and Sarah show hospitality to complete strangers unaware. That they are angels of the Lord. In Colossians chapter 1, our second lesson assigned for today, a letter with a cosmic scope, it shows us that the man Jesus, in a sense, entertained God in his own flesh. We read there that in him, that is in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And furthermore, that you and I are now, that you and I now entertain Jesus in our own flesh. Because we read there, this mystery hidden through the ages and generations, but now revealed, this is the mystery which is Christ in you. And then, of course, the gospel lesson today concludes with this story of Mary and Martha entertaining Jesus in their own home. And by entertaining, I don't mean performing for someone's amusement. I mean making space for, hosting Honoring someone else, in this case, the divine. Abraham entertains angels unawares. Jesus entertained God in his own body. Mary and Martha entertained Jesus in their home. You and I entertain Jesus in our flesh, in our bodies, in our lives. And we now Show hospitality to strangers, knowing that possibly, just possibly, we entertain angels unawares. Today's gospel lesson is unique to Luke, having no counterparts in the other three gospels. Mary and Martha are most famous to us, of course, for their appearance in John chapter 11, where Jesus raises their brother Lazarus from the dead. The village where they live is Bethany some two miles east of Jerusalem, just on the other side of the Mount of Olives. Verse 38 today says, A woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. We see forthrightly and unapologetically that it is Martha's 
home. Mary and Lazarus might live there, but it's Martha's home. Presumably, Martha is older, pays the bills, shoulders the greater responsibility for the household, so it's Martha's home. Mary, you see there, sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. Other translations say listen to his teachings or his word. But Martha, the text says, was distracted by her many tasks. The older translation says she was distracted by much serving. So she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care? that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her then to help me. Seems like a fair, reasonable request to me. No one likes to feel that they get stuck with more than their fair share. No one likes to feel that they're pulling the whole load by themselves, that they are single-handedly, in this case, Preparing and serving a meal for 13 house guests plus two other family members. Who can blame Martha? Who wouldn't feel the same way and make the same appeal? She is serving, providing hospitality, perhaps aware that she is indeed entertaining an angel of sorts. If you've ever been in her first century house shoes, you know the level of resentment that can begin to build and spill over. Others ought to help out, to do their fair share, not be parasitic, as it were. Don't they see that without me, the home, the family, the church, the patient dies? How can you just sit back And receive the fruit of others' labors and not commit to help out. Martha's statement, I'm doing all the work by myself, is both true and angry. It it bespeaks truth, but also resentment. Thank God for Martha. Without her, there is no meal, no house. And no visit. But her emotional state cannot sustain itself without bitterness beginning to take root and blossom. Her cry is familiar to all of us. Lord, don't you care? Lord, you see it. You know all things. Don't, don't you care? Lord, you know what I'm enduring. What I'm holding up under. Don't you care? And you've got the power. The authority to say something, to do something, to remedy this injustice. Do you not care? Am I really supposed to hold up under all this? Because that's not fair. You see, I'm on the verge of a breakdown. Martha, Martha, Jesus responds. When someone calls you by your name twice, my friends, (laughs) you are either in trouble (laughs) or you need some calming down and some comforting. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. The older translation reads, you are anxious and troubled by many things. For how many of us is that the case this morning? You are worried and distracted by many things. We live in a distracting age, beloved. I remember when TV had 13 channels. 
I think I remember when they had three, but I'm not sure, Kent. That was a long time ago. But I, I do remember when they had 13 channels. And you can now get literally hundreds. I remember not having a cell phone. Now someone can call, text, email you 24 hours, seven days a week. I remember no Facebook, no Twitter, no social media at all. And now it is non-stop. I remember choosing among three toothpastes, Colgate, Crest, and AIM. I dare you to count the variety of flavors and combinations and degrees of whitening available now on any aisle. Our worries, my brothers and sisters, our worries financial or about other people or about our health our distractions about world news or our political system are legion. And so we are worried. We are distracted. We are overburdened. And we are overwhelmed. And despite our claims to be blessed and highly favored, in reality we are stressed and highly frustrated. And we may snap at other people. Snap at Mary, and they snap at Lazarus. Most of all, we snap at God, at Jesus. Lord, don't you care? Lord, don't you care? Martha, Martha, Martha. Martha, 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 there is need of only one thing, the text says. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part. The older translation says she has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. As much as I want Jesus to side with Martha and challenge Mary in this text, he sides with Mary and challenges Martha. And according to the text, the one thing necessary, the better part, the good portion, that which cannot be taken away, is simply sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him talk, teach, listening to his word. I'm reminded of the heavenly voice at Jesus' transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And of Paul's reminder to the Romans, faith comes from what is heard. What is heard comes from the preaching of Christ. Other things may be helpful or unhelpful, beneficial or not so much, but God's word is the one thing necessary. Jesus once said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. The prophet Isaiah and the disciple Peter once said, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Perhaps the secret of not stressing out in your life to Overcoming worry and distraction is to remember that only one thing is necessary. The Word of God. Arguably, the secret to not despairing over the fate of a church or a congregation is to recall that only one thing is necessary. The Word of God. And that Word is fundamentally an answer to Martha's and our heartfelt plea, Lord, do you not care? And the Word of God, written in Scripture and embodied in Jesus, is yes. Yes, I do. Doesn't the Word of God say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Doesn't the word of God say, I have come that you might have life 
and have it more abundantly? Doesn't the Word of God say, I chose you from before the foundation of the world. I know you by name and you are mine. When you walk through the fires, you shall not be burned. When you walk through the floods, you shall not be overwhelmed. Do not worry about your life. What you are to eat or wear. Consider the ravens and the lilies of the field. You are of much more value than birds and flowers. Therefore seek ye first the kingdom of God. And the rest shall be added unto you. Your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask him. He knows the number of hairs on your head. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God knit you together in your mother's womb. In Jesus, God's word for you is not yes and no, but in Jesus, every one of God's promises is yes. If God is for you, who can be against you? In Christ, you can do all things through Him who strengthens you. God's anger may be but for a moment, but God's favor lasts a lifetime. No one can snatch you out of God's hands. He gives you a joy which this world cannot take away. And nothing, nothing, nothing shall ever be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Doesn't the word of God say all those things, my friends? My brothers and sisters, the one thing necessary is the word of God. And that word is for you and not against you. That word is for your life, your health, your sanity, your forgiveness, your healing, your restoration, and for the fact that you are a beloved child of God. And so, let us go forth this day so anointed, so indwelt, so Love, so focused and centered on that one necessary thing, that better part, that which cannot be revoked or taken away. That everybody passing down falls of the news, stops, looks up and points and says, that's it. That's the place where Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. That every person passing down falls of the news, stops and looks up and points and says, right there, right there is the place where everyone sings, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see that every passerby in Wake County beholds this sacred space, gets goosebumps and moist eyes, and says, right there, right there is the place entrusted with the mysteries of God, and which proclaims, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the free gift of God. A place where it is lived and believed and proclaimed, God will not leave you nor fail you nor forsake you, but lo, He is with you always, even until the end of the age. A place where angels are entertained unawares. A place where the people are indwelt with Jesus and Jesus is indwelt with God. A true declaration house where the imperishable jewel of the free gospel salvation shines forth clear and where the cry of Lord, Lord, do you not care is always, always, always answered with a resounding yes, 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 I do. This, my friends, is the true declaration house. Amen.